and welcome to Aspects of Writing. I'm your host, James Kelly, and my co-host is Janet Corsi. And we're talking about writing about life's experiences today. And our guest is Martha Hoy. Martha was born in West Virginia. She has one brother. She's a registered nurse. Uh, in 2003, she was involved in an accident that would change her life forever and in many ways. Um, her book is called Lead With Your Heart. So Martha, first of all, what brought you to Las Vegas? I moved to Las Vegas to build my charitable organization called Mother Martha Family Foundation. Okay. And how long ago was that? I moved here October of 2018. Okay. All right. And so you've only been here about a year. Yeah. Yeah. Just about a year. Yeah. Okay. And what? tell us a little bit about what led you to create the Martha, um, Mother Martha Foundation. Oh, well, well, doll, that is a whole book. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you were involved in the accident in 2003, yes, which was, really changed your life. That's what That was the big catalyst in my life. I was in a car accident in 2003. Um, I made the front page newspaper the next day, May 31st, 2003. It is not a good way to get your five minutes of fame. I know. Yeah, well, um, I was blessed anyway because three people had passed away. Uh, a mother, a father, and a, and a daughter. And they were in the other car that, yes. hit, that hit you? Yes, yeah. they were in the car that hit me, yes, yeah. that's correct. And there was one more person who survived that accident? Yes, there was a third car that was involved, but that person was treated immediately at the hospital and released mm -hmm. a couple of hours later. And so to set the premise of what this whole story is about, what happened with you in the accident? Um, well, after the accident, um, yeah, it was a long recovery. I had 15 surgeries, um, including facial reconstruction, uh, both of my knees. Um, you know, I was told by physicians that I would never be a nurse, I would never walk, I would never do all these things. And um, you were actually in nursing school at that time, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I was in nursing school. I was uh, on my way home from work that evening. Um, when I was being hit, when I was hit from behind. And the wow. other thing interesting about that accident was is that the um, uh, airbags did not go off in the car. No, the airbags did not go off. And when I was hit from behind, I was in the far right-hand lane, and I was pushed across all lanes of traffic, and I actually, the front of my car hit the concrete barrier. So... The airbags did not go off, so most of the injuries that I had to my body were on the left side, and I did not have side airbags either in my car. Oh, my gosh. So most of the injuries were to the left side of my face, mm -hmm. and the left side of my body. Yeah. yeah. All right, so it was during that recovery period. You were married at the time. Yes, I was married. Um, I understand that probably wasn't the best relationship in the world. No. Hmm. That's that's why it isn't anymore. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> but it, it was, when, when, wh what direction did the story take? after you started going through recovery? Um, well, you know, it, it's, it's just after something happens that is so life-altering because, you know, you're going about your life and everything is good. You have all these plans, and then all of a sudden, here you are. You're in bed. You're yeah. in the hospital. Can't move. Can't, can't go nowhere. Can't move. Can't go anywhere. The only thing that I could see was the ceiling. That was it. Oh, my heavens. And, um, you know... Um, I was in the hospital for a little while. The thing that changed my perception was a friend of mine brought me a book that uh, was called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. A gentleman had written about his experiences as a prisoner in World War II. He was in one of the worst concentration camps of World War II. And the premise of that book is, is that you can choose how you respond to your situation. Mm -hmm. Right. And he definitely, through his book, taught me, because he lived in something that I would consider, you know, the, one of the most hellish things that you could probably live through. Yeah. And he still came out with a great attitude and helped others until, you know, the end of his life. Mm hmm so yeah. at what point, there was a point after the accident, you eventually divorced your first husband. Yes. Um, after I recovered from, my accident, from the accident, um, a couple years later, I found out I had multiple sclerosis. Oh. So once again, I was battling with um, 
you know, health problems. Mm -hmm. um, the relationship was not great. And um, Mother's Day 2018, uh, actually one year today, I left him mm -hmm. in just my pajamas, a suitcase, and my car keys. Wow. I just walked away. And did he know where you were going? No. I didn't know where I was going. Oh, you didn't know where you were going? No. How did you end up here? I had no idea where I was going. I just knew. <laughs> and because of, of legal reasons and, and, and that, I can't get into details, but I just knew that I had to leave. It was imperative for my safety that I had to leave that house. All right. Now, there's another part of this story which you need to lead into. You met uh, someone, I believe, from Uganda. Yes. And how did that person enter your life? During the recovery uh, from the from the car accident, I met a gentleman, a young man, uh, who was an orphan in Uganda. His name is Jeffrey Mugisha, and I know I probably messed that up because <laughs> I do every time. Um, we met over Facebook, over the internet, social media, and I just he was a. I, I just knew right away what a remarkable young man. Um, and knowing, you know, my father was an orphan, and knowing what little I knew about Uganda, um, you know, we struck up a great friendship. And um, through that friendship is how eventually uh, two foundations were, were created, one in, in the U.S. and one in um, Kampala, Uganda. So what year did, did, did you meet Jeffrey? It was a little bit later, uh, about the time that I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Okay. and But that was just a friendship on the Internet in the beginning. Right. In the beginning, it was just, um, it was just more, we had a very, we had a lot of interest the same. Mm -hmm. um, he, we both have a passion for learning. Um, so we kind of ex exchanged ideas. Okay. We talked about what life was like in our cultures, what life was like for us in our countries, and, you know, which from the outside looking in, we are very different. Mm -hmm. You know, I live in the U.S., he lives in Uganda, which is about 10,000 miles difference. You know, culture is different. Mm -hmm. We look different, um, you know, but truly, you know, we found a great connection in each other because... Truly, we are all the same. We have way more similarities in all of us than differences. And unfortunately, yeah. people spend way too much time pointing out the differences between us. So when did you finally meet Jeffrey? Jeffrey? Well, I actually met him face to face after we had done all of these things together um, this, this past uh, March. All right. So you've been communicating. How many years did you communicate? Six on years. And the Martha, the Mother Martha Foundation was created before you ever met him. Face to face, yes. Face to face, right. Yes. I mean, you had, you, it all came about because of that internet connection. Right. And I'm sure it's because Jeffrey shared the economic hardships that they're going through in Uganda. You've shared with me that only 11% of the population there have electricity. Correct. You have a school over there, but they don't even have computers they need or the electricity for yeah. the school. Um, so the, the situation is very harsh. And there's a lot of children over there who are orphaned. Yes, about 2.5 million average. Mm -hmm. And why are they orphaned? Um, I think there are many factors to that. Um, uh, probably the environment um, at some point, uh, which is better, um, you know, HIV numbers, well, which has improved. Isn't there also civil unrest? There and, is civil yeah. unrest there, and yes. So there's a lot of slaughtering. Yeah, so there yeah. there are many factors to that. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I met Jeffrey's brother first, actually, because when I ran from my home a year ago today, um, I... I stayed with a friend for a few days, and I didn't know where I was going to go. I mean, just like, you know, refugees are, you know, forced out of their homes. Right. Yeah. I, I really felt felt very much empathy for them because that happened to me. Yeah. You know, I'm yeah. in my bedroom, and I'm just, uh, you know, minding my own business, and all of a sudden I'm forced out of my home for my safety. So yeah. um, when that happened, his brother lives in Minneapolis, and... Um, 
He said, come stay with Jeffrey's me. Jeffrey's brother. Jeffrey's brother, mm-hmm. yes. How fortunate. Yeah, he said, come stay with me. You have done so much for my brother, and you have done so much mm-hmm. in yeah. Uganda that you can come stay with me. And I knew I'd be safe there. It's You know, Minnesota's a peaceful place, yes. a beautiful place. And I knew that he would take good care of me. But did you go there? Or did you I did. I okay. did. And I, I trusted that he would take care of me, and I had never seen him before. Right. So all I had was a picture, and I bought a plane ticket. I filed for divorce in West Virginia, bought a plane ticket to Minneapolis, and I still I, I didn't have my pajamas on anymore, obviously. <laughs> Thank goodness. <Yeah. laughs> I know. It is nice to know you yeah, finally I changed change into clothes. some clothes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I changed clothes, and I still had the same uh, suitcase, um, and I booked a flight to Minneapolis, and I had a picture on my phone. And I sat and I told him, I was like, I'm near the piano, you know, Mm -hmm. and all he had was a picture too. So, you know, we're looking at phones. Right. But as soon as I saw that young man come around the corner and I saw his smile, I knew who he was because Uh his smile looks just like Jeffrey's smile. Uh huh. And he and his roommate, Joe, uh, Joe is from Rwanda. Um, until I could get on my feet, you know, I'm a nurse, so I didn't have any trouble finding a job and all those things. So I got set up pretty quickly. Um, so um, they helped me out. They let me stay there. They didn't ask for anything, and they were very nice, very respectful. Mm, okay. That's great. So now, uh, when was the first time you went to Uganda? This March. Okay. So that was very recent. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I've spoken to you quite a bit since that because you came back from there. You had been in several places. Uh, one of the things I want to share with what you've done with starting your foundation, and it all came from what you went through, is that I know when you got back from, I think you had flown in from Uganda. You had been in Dubai, and then you'd been somewhere in Italy, and then you came back. Um, you actually had a phone call. This is what your organization does. You actually had a phone call about a, a child who had been He was orphaned. He hadn't eaten in five days and nowhere to stay. And you're here in the United States, and you were able to somehow uh, find a place for him to stay and get him food. How did that work? I'm very very blessed with a lot of nice friends there. Um, And, of course, when you get these phone calls, and you have to remember that Uganda is 10 hours, 12 hours difference time zone. So if they're calling at 3 p.m. there, you know, it's the middle of the night for us. Right. Which is fine. They could call whenever. Um, you know, I, I have lots of friends. Um, our foundation, um, you know, starts calling and finding people and say, can you verify this? Can you find this child? And there's no street signs there. So there are you no literally, street signs. You have to know <laughs> no. people there who actually know where to go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I have uh, a Sam that I hired when I was there, and he will always be my driver when I'm there. Um Driving in the capital city of Uganda is like being in an action movie because there are no street signs, there are no <laughs> traffic lights. Oh my there gosh! There are just motorcycles everywhere. It, it's quite action packed. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> so, and, and the name of this foundation again is okay. My foundation is called Mother Martha Family Foundation. Uh huh. The foundation in Uganda is called Amka Foundation Africa. Uh huh. And Jeffrey started that foundation December of 2017. Uh huh. The reason is, is because during the time that we had struck up a friendship and we're talking on the internet, mm-hmm. and uh, this is an exceptional young man. I mean, this this young man taught himself how to read just for picking up pieces of paper that people had left on the ground. Oh, wow. Yeah. And Ambition. he never asked me for a dime. Never. So one day God just let it, he put it on my heart that I needed to help this young man. So I decided that I was going to put him through school, uh-huh. uh, through a couple of years of college. Hopefully, at some point, we'll get to do some more. And um, when I decided I was going to do that, he the only stipulation was this, that he pay it forward in some way. Uh-huh. I didn't want anything. Just do something kind for another person. Uh huh. You know, and so... That's how the foundation in Kampala was born, is because that's his way of paying the kindness forward. To so Jeffries went to college well. three years ago, four years ago. Yes. Yeah. And then it's after he got the, his first degree. Yes. He graduated in yeah. December of 2017. Right. And then he started the foundation. Yes. Yeah. That was his way of paying it forward. That was his way of paying it forward. Wow. And um, what happened was 
at that time, um, and I was talking about refugees and how I understood what they went through. Um, at that time, yeah. there were a lot of refugees going into northern Uganda from South Sudan. And in fact, at the time, Bindi Bindi refugee camp is the large was the largest refugee camp in the world. And that Christmas, Jeffrey took up donations and um, took the foundation right into the refugee camp. Mm -hmm. And that's how the foundation was actually born, from that act of kindness. Yeah. And they also started school, is that correct? Yes, Amphia Foundation Africa. Um, and you can go on their website and check them out. Um, they have um, programs for young people. It's kind of a way to give a hand up and not a handout. Right. Um, there are fashion design courses. Uh, the first uh, graduating class of ladies graduated in January. Fabulous. And there's uh, fashion. Des there's fashion design. There is um, cosmetology. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want to have a computer class, but the problem is, is we have. 20 students signed up for the next, because the next classes start in June. Mm -hmm. We have 20 students and only one computer. Yeah, that's problematic. And how? Yeah. What, are, what are they doing for power? They AMCA does have power. Okay. They are a part of that. Yeah. Okay. And it is located in an area that uh, where these types of things are sorely needed. Um, in the future, you know, if we can get the funds, we would like to start classes with auto mechanics and mm -hmm. um, welding, you know, because a lot of the problems uh, there is, you know, we ha they have so many orphans, and, and there are wonderful, loving people that are starting orphanages and are out there trying to help as much as they can. But the problem is, is when Jeffrey, you know, would, would say that you know when they came out of the orphanage they had no way to support themselves right mm -hmm. they had no skills they had no way yeah to be economically independent uh-huh and they're not like here where you can go to a trade school if you don't go to the university and get a degree mm -hmm. you, here you can go to a trade school if you want to right. and earn a degree so over there it's much more difficult much more difficult yeah and yeah. these kids we need to understand the setting too it isn't a situation to where they're at home, they're in their bedroom, they're watching TV, and they're bored, and what am I going to do in life? A lot of these kids don't have any economical su economic support. Sometimes there's no parent, or they're living in a shack. Um, clothing is, is difficult for them. Just probably having shoes on their feet is difficult for them. Yes. Um, eating, eating is something that is a problem there. Just having enough food yes. and water. If, if you eat more than one meal per day, you're considered wealthy in, in a lot of areas there. Yeah. That's yeah. And, um, and when, you, when you have an empty stomach and you don't have your basic needs met, mm -hmm. you know, you can't, you can't function to do other things. And um, there's great talent there. Um, it, there's great talent there. I, I was there. I saw it, you know. The fashion design ladies, and um, they they're gonna start what they call crafts. See, here we would call it jewelry making, but um, there they call it crafts. Mm -hmm. And the ladies mm -hmm. make earrings and different pieces of jewelry from you know the materials that they have. Mm -hmm. So I, I there's talent there. It's there. They yeah. just need a hand up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, um, we don't think about. I mean, the United States has its own problems as well. We do have yeah. children that go to school hungry. Yes. Um, actually, quite a few students go to school hungry every day in this yes. country. But even at the worst conditions, it's hard to fathom what it would be like for a child there. Um, I think that you would almost have to be there to kind of grasp what it's like um, when there is no true home. I have friends from the Philippines, and I know what their life was like, and they lived in what was called Tin Village. But even that is it's better, better than the situation that some of these kids come from. Yeah. yeah. When you're digging through the garbage, you know, other people's garbage to eat. Right. And clothe yourself. And clothe yourself. And, um, you know, and, you know, and, and when you're a child, you know, imagine being five years old and homeless with mm -hmm. no one to take care of you. What would you do? You know, and that's the situation that 2.5 on average is, is dealing with. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So the Mother Martha Foundation does what? Well, we do two different things. In the U.S., we do um, the, we do something different than we do in Uganda because um, based on my book, um, you know, uh, we do a lot of women's empowerment thing here in the U.S. Uh-huh. I give a lot of speeches, and we have a lot of new projects coming out for that. And then in Uganda, uh, we are partnering with um, AMCA, with Jeffrey and Francis and Antuchu, which is the other gentleman that's uh, over AMCA. Forty um, percent uh, of the proceeds from my book go to AMCA, okay. so we can get sewing machines because we need sewing mach- machines for the for the ladies and um, for computers. So, um, and what's coming up for the future for my foundation is um, where AMCA is helping, you know, give people skills so they can be independent and self-reliant. Yes. I want to come in with my foundation and help with the children. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And on my trip there, I went to, um, and I will mess this name up, <laughs> Valamu Children's Village. And that is the orphanage that Jeffrey and his brother grew up in. And met the gentleman that runs it. His name is Uncle Joseph. And as far as I'm concerned, he's the most patient man on the planet. (laughs) 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 Yeah. Uh You know, he has um, what has grown into around 780 children. Wow. And uh, I saw the needs there. And um, if you look at my Facebook page, my social media, um, these children have great needs. There's There's a great need there. Um, he said the, the the most difficult part for him is you know feeding them. Yeah, yeah, it's got to be incredible. But if you see me walking through the school rooms, I mean, you know, here, yes, like you said, we have problems, whatever. But honey, they don't have desks. They don't have books. Mm-hmm. They don't have pencil and paper. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have a chalkboard on the wall in a room. Mm-hmm. And everybody just piles in. Right. And they take turns on the chalkboard. So I uh, went through the sleeping areas of the children. They have mattresses. And you'll also see this on my Facebook page. Um, they have mattresses that they all sleep in. They have, you know, great big rooms. They ha- each, uh, each house, you know, has a certain amount of children in them. Because I kept thinking, how does one guy... Make sure that almost 800 children get their homework done and right. get yeah. bathed and clothed. You know, you know, I mean, you know. Yeah. So each house uh, has a house mother, and the house mother is responsible for those children. And and and, and I noticed too that you know, the older children help the younger children, right? That's good. You know, so That's they kind great. of they they pitch in and help each other. But even the sleeping conditions are uh, really upsetting. Um, they have mattresses that they put on the floor, and then when they get up in the morning, they take them outside to dry. Okay. To dry? To dry. Oh. So, you know, um, they don't have a specific area to, s- to eat. So when they do prepare meals, it's find a place to sit, mm-hmm. find a place to go to eat. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, it, and the work he's doing is, is amazing, but the, the, he needs help. Well, we know what yeah. you're going to do with the book because a portion of it goes to the foundation, but yes. why the book? What inspired you yeah. to write the book? Um, I felt as though that people needed to know my story. And I felt this was the time. Mm-hmm. The time is because my story involves a lot of topics that are coming to light in the world right now. Mm-hmm. Like racism. Yes. And, um, you know, domestic violence issues. And domestic violence, yes. yes. Um, and um, dealing with tragedy, dealing with tragedy and how to and I felt like that it would help show people, you know, if I can respond out of love and take all of this and turn it into something good, then, honey, you can, too. Yeah. Right. And I think that's what we need more of yeah. is people to take their experiences and turn it into something positive. Um, and you're working on a second book now. I believe. Yes, I am. I'm working on a second book. And on my trip on the other side of the planet, I was doing a lot of research um, for my next book. Um, it's kind of what happened, you know, after the foundation started, what we plan to do in the future. Um, 
I did some uh, investigative work in Dubai. <laughs> mm-hmm. What happens when Ugandans go to Dubai and they are promised all of these wonderful things? Please come to Dubai. We have wonderful jobs for you. You can send money back to your family. And um, that's not usually how it works out. Well, they go there with the idea that that's what they're going to do is go to work, let's say in the hotel, as either a server in a restaurant or a maid or whatever they can find work at. And then the reality of it is... Yeah, there isn't. There isn't. There isn't. So then they end up in another part of Dubai that the world doesn't talk too much about. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, um, because we see Dubai, and it is bright and shiny and wonderful and a lot of fun. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but there is a part of Dubai that you don't see on the news, you don't see on television. Mm-hmm. And there is an actual park um, of what I would consider the old side of Dubai, because I understand it is one of the oldest cities in the Middle East, mm-hmm. um, where there's an entire park of men from East Africa that, you know, went to Dubai in search of work, a better, you know, better life for themselves, right. a better life for their families, and they end up homeless in this park. And um, to the point that, you know, some of them have actually sold their passports in order to be able to eat. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And there's also another area, which I was not allowed to take pictures, and I don't blame them, where young girls from East Africa end up. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they go for maid jobs and, you know, sometimes end up in, in, you know, sex Sex rings. rings. Yeah. Yeah. So trying to find a better life sometimes doesn't work out that well. Yeah. For most of them. Um, What was the process that you began to write? When did you start writing the book? Um, well, lead with your heart, I had started writing oh, I want to say I had started writing it about a year ago, but to seriously put it on paper and say, "Here it comes was August of two thousand eighteen okay, oh, and how many great. pages is your book um okay. it's it's a short read yeah it's, it's a very it's, short it's read it's a short read but it's you know to the probably point. about 70 pages yeah yeah somewhere yeah. there yeah 100 or so yeah. yeah but you have a lot in that 70 pages yeah yeah you c- kind of condense that down <laughs> <laughs> so, action packed just yeah, like driving packed, in Kampala right, right. Uganda <laughs> You're right not, not yeah. wordy like me you just go right to the nuts just, and bolts yeah, here of it, it is. and right yeah. and, uh, <laughs> there ain't much to it than that um, as a matter of fact, if they were ever to make this into a movie, they would have to add to it. <laughs> well, we can add details. Yeah. <laughs> we can definitely uh, add the details. All right. uh, and you're working on your second book now. Did you ever think you were ever going to be an author? Was that something you ever thought about? I always loved writing. Okay. Absolutely. I've always loved writing, but no. Did I ever think that you would have a I published would write book. a book and, uh, do you know, that I would be you know, forced out of my home and then end up in Las Vegas and a year later yeah. <laughs> and end up all around the world. No, I'd never, I never thought any of this stuff would happen. I mean, think about in one year, what's happened in your life in just one year is pretty yeah. miraculous. It's, it's pretty amazing. And, and I always tell people that I enjoyed the journey. I really have. Yeah. It's been a lot of fun despite, you know, all of the negative. Well, sometimes you take the negative and you make it a positive. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I try to do that every day. <laughs> some, you, some days it's easier than some others. Some days it's right? much easier than others. <laughs> uh, are, well, you, are you still practicing as a nurse? Oh, absolutely, doll. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, at least a couple of days a week. And nursing is something that um, once you are one, it's in. It's you. It's mm-hmm. who. It's not what you do. It's who you are. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That can go away. Yes. You know, we had Dave Cavassi on the show. His wife's a nurse. Um, then we had Joyce Gatchenberger, who's another co-host. You mm-hmm. were on with her when yeah. we did the show. Um, she's a nurse. And everyone says the same thing. If you something that once you're a nurse, you can't get away from it. It's, it's there for life. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So um, you've been working on the new book. What, what is the new book about? Give me an idea what that's going to be about. 
Um, like I said, it's going to be a follow-up from the previous, and I'm actually going to go into much more detail in this book. Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> a little more than uh, 70 pages. A little more. I got you hooked on the first one. Good. Right? Good. So you got to get kind of coming back for more, right? Okay. So um, it's going to be a lot more detail. I'm going to um, go back a little bit and um, tell some details about what had happened in the past and how I'm using that uh, to, to, again... You know, turn the negative into positive, and um, about what we're d- what we plan to do and what we are doing in Uganda. I'm getting ready to go back in a couple of months um, if we get enough donations and uh, help get some more things started there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, we're yeah. going to help you with some of that. I know. Well, when yeah. it comes to writing this autobiography, um, how did it change your life? You've already mentioned some of how it's changed your life, but I would you say it's greatly changed your life? It's greatly changed my life um, because, uh, you know, people don't realize when they look at me that I have multiple sclerosis. No, or that you had no facial reconstruction. That I've had right, facial reconstruction. That I've had, you know, I have I have a lot of titanium in my body. Uh-huh. <laughs> Hard to go through the metal detectors, I'm sure. <laughs> so you know. Um, once people realize, you know, they read my story and they say, wow, look at what all you went through. But look at what you're doing. And people always yeah. ask me the same thing. Are you still a nurse? And usually I go, well, yeah, I worked yesterday. Right. So um, you probably yeah. work last night. I don't know how you, you have know, time. You know, so uh, it's greatly changed my life because I feel like that people have learned from that, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, people say I would have never thought this of you. And I'm like, well. You know, where focus goes, energy flows. If that's what we focus on, that's what we get. So uh-huh. what does your brother think about you writing this book? I don't know. <laughs> you don't speak? Or? No, we don't. So there's distance there. Yeah. Uh, you know, after I left uh, West Virginia and I left my marriage, there's been a, a, a divide between my family and I. Okay. Yeah. So they uh-huh. perceive him differently than you did. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And we know that's quite common, actually, yes. in, in relationships. Yeah. Um, what would you recommend to someone who wants to write a life story? Like, how would how do you think they should go about doing it? Like, what did you do? Did you do an outline? Did you just start off with the story and just keep going on the computer? What was your process? I started with an outline. I said, "What do I want people to know? What What do I What do I definitely want people to walk away with?" Okay, you know, yeah. what do that's I important. Want them to know what What's them, the passion behind what it? What do I want them to feel? And then from there, I just started writing it sort of like, you know, we're sitting on the front porch and we're drinking, you know, sweet tea and I'm just telling you my story. Right, yeah. Uh-huh. And that's kind of like what I wanted it to feel like. Mm-hmm. Ah, yeah. I like that idea. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you have to do? You didn't have to do a whole lot of research. I mean, I know you had to do some because I see pictures in the book, like from the newspaper and stuff. So there was some research you had to do. A little, yeah. 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 Um, how long did it, you said it took from August to what? February. It yeah. came out in February. August. That's not so bad. No, six months, seventy pages. No. That's not bad. Yeah. And I was, um, you know, in, in the, I moved here and, you know, I was building my foundation and working and all these things at the same time. So mm-hmm. in that case, it's incredible because uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm lucky to get two or three sentences <laughs> written all month long. Now, I know you have a publisher. How did you go about finding the publisher or did they find you? Um, well, it was just kind of a random thing. You know, I, you know, started doing some research on the Internet and, and uh, we just we hooked up really quick. Mm-hmm. Wow. Be- did you ever consider just self-publishing? Mm, no, because I really wanted someone because, you know, of the trauma that I had just lived through at the time. I mm. really needed someone who was a impartial party. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Look at my writing because, you know. When but you had you, never written before. Right. And, you know, being writing about such traumatic things, you know, I, I knew that I would you know, mess up, maybe think that I'm saying one thing, but not really writing it, mm-hmm. you know, because sometimes things sound yes. a certain way in your head, but when you put them on paper, it uh-huh. doesn't work out that yeah. way. Yeah. Actually, that's the way it is for almost everyone when they're writing, even for someone who, I don't know if you'd say professional writer, but someone who's a skilled writer, 
um, you're thinking one thing, and then when you get ready to put it on the paper, especially if you don't write it down right away, it comes out differently. Yeah. Um, and then you end up rewriting it again. And <laughs> so that whole process can change quite a bit. Yes. Uh, all right. So you were self-published. Well, no, you no. weren't self-published. You were published. How involved is that publisher in what you're doing now? Like, do you have an agent or do you have no, a manager? I don't. I no, don't. Okay. So she's pretty much acting through all this for you. Because you're also out there soliciting this as a movie, I believe. Yes. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not allowed to say who's looking at it, but... Right. We won't talk yeah. about who's looking at it. Yeah. But, but the I thing is, so. But how did you get it in that person's hands? A uh, friend of a friend, and I said, wow, great, I have their address. Great, they want to read the book. How did you make I all these connections? <laughs> how did you make all these connections? I mean, I know the, some of the people that you are connected with. How did you make those connections? Um... That honestly, when I got here, it was put some books in my purse and start knocking on doors. And that's really all you did? Wow. Yes. I know someone that you know. I know someone from the past that you presently had a conversation with. And I'm just curious how that happened with someone who owns a small casino here in town. How did that come about? Oh, okay. Well, um, well, probably patient confidentiality but i as a nurse okay so sometimes okay. your connections are accidental sure and this, this we call person, it serendipity right. it's just that you just happen to have this book at this time and right and then hey and then come to find out that uh she has family in the same town that i grew up in well that uh -huh. always helps having yeah. something in so common when we started talking you know it was like oh yeah i know that person i know this person and, and we realized that we were actually connected uh-huh yeah. And we knew a lot of the same people. So, but really, truly, like I said, you know, somehow we are all connected. Yes. We're, it's so know, no interesting in life how we don't realize how small the world is, for one thing. Yes. And how connected we are as well. For example, the poster behind you, we had a guest on the show who, this was just a few months ago. Yeah. She's a children's author, and she comes in. She comes skipping down the hallway to follow the Yellow Brick Road, singing it. Walked in the studio here, saw that poster, and said, I know that person. Yeah, the person that created the poster. That person, meanwhile, I had contacted to see if her son would want to be on our show because he's now a famous children's author. It turned out that when he was 10, this person who saw this poster this woman talked her into becoming an, uh, an author. Yeah. This woman talked her into oh, wow. becoming a children's author. Yeah. Oh, wow. Ten years later, she's having a difficult time with the son. Ask this person if she would talk to her son for her. And he didn't think, she didn't think he was having a problem. So she convinced him, just keep writing, keep doing what you're doing. Now he's a best-selling author. Yeah. A month later, after her being on the show, they were on the show together. Yeah, all of them. I mean, it's amazing it's how this world works and how this whole thing. And, and they hadn't communicated in several years either. Right. And now they're back to talking all the oh, time great. again. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's they, great. Yeah, the friendship picked right up where they left off. That's yeah. great. So it's a small world. It really is. And, you know, on my when I came back from my trip, um, I, I said I had, you know, I had a, a really good time. You know, I... I drove a Ferrari in Dubai. I had pizza in Milan, and I got <laughs> malaria in Uganda. Right? That's right. Oh. <laughs> so quite a you adventure, got it all. Right? So <laughs> and that was my thing because uh, as you know, we just had measles come in LAX. Right. Yes. So you know if uh, you know we are all connected. If we allow something like that, and, and with malaria, if I hadn't been a nurse and known. You that know, something was that wrong. I was that I knew what was wrong. I knew that I could spread this. You know, just me coming out of East Africa, yes. coming back to Las Vegas, an area where people come from all over the Millions world. Millions of people, yeah, through the yeah. airport. So that one person could have caused an epidemic or a pandemic. Yes, exactly. Of malaria. Yes. So, you know, that's where people don't understand this. I, and and unfortunately, a lot of times that people don't care about something until it's on their front doorstep. I, and I think that you're right, and I think that's sad. We forget, growing up in my era, prior to my being born, millions of people would lose their lives to things like malaria or like the measles, just something as simple as measles. Mm -hmm. I have friends uh, who lost his brother to strep throat because penicillin had just been invented and wasn't being dispersed you know, readily to right. families. 
And the only reason he got strep throat as well. And when the brother died, they said, let's try this new penicillin and see if this will, you know, what will happen. Uh, so we think that you know, how could someone die from strep throat? Right. Well, it was quite possible 50, 60 years ago. Uh-huh. Sure. You yeah. know, um, and y- that's why people need to look at when we do to go to eradicate. And I'm glad you brought this up because yeah. immunization has become a big topic today. Mm-hmm. Like, should we give shots mm-hmm. to our children? And for whatever reason, they're not doing it. They're, they're really adding to the problem you just mentioned in that if someone comes here from another country with something and we're not, immu- you know, immunized, then right. we're spreading that disease now. Yep. And it can be, a, you know, an epidemic r- very quickly. Yes. So I think what you said is very important. That was really, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. And, and there, um, when I came back, I was very upset with the Gates Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. Why did you pull out of Uganda? Come back. Yeah. You know, a lot of the people there don't know that there are preventatives because I did take the preventative before I left and I took the pill every day when I was there to prevent malaria, but nothing mm-hmm. is 100%. Right. And a lot of the people that live there have had malaria sometimes up to 70 times in their lives, and they have no idea that there are inoculations. They have no idea that there's medications for malaria. So as the rest of the world where we don't have these type of problems, we don't have malaria problems here. Right. But if we, you know, as a, as if we let things like that go anywhere, Mm-hmm. It's gonna whether yeah. you know it's gonna at some point end up on your front doorstep. Yeah, mm-hmm. and the measles thing is is just a, an example of that right. very fit very thing. Yeah, yeah. We're probably I'm probably gonna get flack on the radio for having talked about this. <laughs> That's okay because <laughs> nah. it's supposed to be about authors, but you know it is an important topic that people need to consider. Sure, and, yes. and we do need to have more talk about it. Yeah. All right, so you need to write a book about it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Get this topic going so we yeah. can officially talk about it on the air. Right. Uh, all right. So now we know that you, you're working on your second book. Um, I, I want to make it clear. You and Jeffrey do not have a romantic relationship. No, no, no. no. It's never been about romance. No, no. It's always been a friendship. A friendship. Right. And I think that it would be easy to read between the lines the way you talk about it because it really sounds like a romance. But that's what's wonderful and unique about this is that you became friends with someone who was a total stranger sure. whom you'd never met, a different race, a different country, usually a country that people belittle and put down. Sure. We've known people who called it a Yeah, thanks, Trump. Uh, <laughs> nah. But, you know, the thing <laughs> is, is that, um, you know, so it, it really is important to understand that we are all connected. Sure. Absolutely. Yes. And we forget that skin color has nothing to do nothing with to it. Nothing to do with it. Yeah. Um, or race. We're not always, skin color isn't always involved, you know, right. when it comes to race or nationality. So we're one world. And I think that's what your book is, Im- why it's important, is that we're, we're trying to open people's minds on how we can change the world. One person can change things. You're yes. proving that right now. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And and I think that that's what's important here is to understand is that when you say, well, who am I? I don't know no one. You didn't know anyone a year ago. No, I didn't. And I know you know a lot of people now. <laughs> so yeah. the thing is, is that, and we're talking important leaders in the world. So the thing is, is that it doesn't matter who you are, what your background is, or where you come from. You can touch people. Sure. And you can make changes if you're sincere in what you're trying to do. And I think that's what we need to understand is like if you have a passion or you want to do something, you did it by writing this book. And it's amazing how a little book, we're talking 70 pages basically, can go out there and influence. And that's what most authors do. I, as an author, and I'm a fiction writer, but as an author, I write to change the world. I really do write to change the perspective on the way we see and do things. Yep. Um, there's a lot of hidden messages even in fiction writing. Yep. And, and I think that's what the power of the pen is all about. And, and what you've done is you've proven that to be true. Absolutely. Um, and look, de- definitely differences, you know, but we made such a big connection, you know. I mean, not only is there culture, there's the age difference, there's, you know, uh, like I said, 10,000 miles between us. But... Um, and 
and we saw the world through each other. You know, you painted we, the yeah. pictures for I each painted, other. We did, and I think too. And when you talked about perception, I think that people get a di- get bad, wrong perceptions of other places and other people. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and I made I was interviewed for a newspaper in Uganda recently, and you know I I praised the country because it's so beautiful. The people are so nice. They have such heart there, and. Um, I, s- I made the example is uh, I was at Disneyland one year and a lady backed away from me when she found out I was American because she had heard and saw on TV that we are violent people and oh. that we do this and that. And I said, no, honey, we're, you know, um, and uh, it was started raining. So I helped her get out of the rain and, and, you know, she had her child and her husband was with her. And he looked this, and I, we got something to eat. And um, her husband looked at her and he said, I told you that it is a peaceful culture. (laughs) (laughs) It's so funny how we perceive the world in other places as violent or or, um, places that you would never want to go to. Right. And in reality, America gets its rap, too. It gets its bad rap, you know. And I think in me going there, um, I also think that that has broken down perceptions for them mm-hmm. yes. as to what America is And that's what we like. do. Every time right. we talk about something or we act on mm-hmm. something, that's how you break the barriers. And that's okay. how you get the conversation going. And we have another show we're trying to get up on the, you know, and going. And we're going to have you on that show. It's called The Common Thread. And that's what that whole show is about. It's about um, opening yeah. up conversation. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether you agree or disagree or have a different opinion. We, st- we want to hear it, but we want everyone to have a voice on it. We'll always have more than one person on so that you can have the pros and cons of both. And I'm, it's a show that will be dedicated to not who's right or who's wrong, but what we can do and how we can sure. see things differently. So we'll have you back on the common thread. That show is early on the air, but we're not on a steady basis. But hopefully in the near future we'll be weekly. So. Yeah. I, I, I write a lot of quotes, and I think that's what caused my popularity on social media but um, one of the quotes that I write is um, you know we don't have to agree in order to love each other sometimes disagreeing actually causes motion right things to get done exactly and in our own personal lives sometimes it isn't until sometimes you get angry even with a spouse that something sometimes there's something bothering you let's just say and you don't know what it is. And someone's being moody. And finally, you say, I've had enough. What's going on? You know, why are you acting this way? Right. And then the truth comes out. And something may have happened at work. Mm-hmm. Or something right. may have happened with someone else you encountered. And for whatever reason, you're holding that in. Well, holding that in doesn't do you any good. Mm-hmm. Right. Sometimes you need someone to, to talk to. We all need someone we to talk do. to. Do. And if Absolutely. you can't talk through it, then you're always going to have, you're going to harbor that. Right. And it's going to fester in a way that's probably very ugly somewhere sure, down the road. Sure, absolutely. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So are we solving the world's problems right now? Sure. <laughs> I <laughs> hope so. We got, we got this, James and Janet. We got it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what can you tell? Uh, well, tell me what you've ex- what what's been your experience with this book as far as the process goes when it comes to publishing? Because we did an event here and you didn't have some books oh, you were yeah. hoping you have. So yeah, we, okay. it's a rocky road no matter what we do. Sure. Um, and I think that's one of the things as an author when you're out there writing, you have to expect this. And I know I've, I've had authors who say, I have to have this book done by such and such time on this date. And, yeah. And then, then the you know deadline gets there and you don't have it done. Um, it, I find that I would say probably, well, 100% of the time of people I know, it's not the end of the world. Right. It doesn't make yeah. any difference about how that book is received because nobody knows um, unless you've out there and announced it's done now. Um, no one's really going to know it, but I've actually done that. I've actually put out there. This book's going to be available on such and such. And a year later, I'm saying this book will be ready. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Is that not yes, true? Yeah. Actually, continue the continue. last two books I had, you know, yeah. uh, I'll have that ready. I w- we did my very first aspects of writing event, which was a year ago this week. Mm-hmm. Um, it was supposed to be for the three books that I was putting out. Right. All the authors that was here had books out. I didn't have my three books ready. Yeah. (laughs) And the whole thing was based on the fact that I was going to promote my three new books. This year, I'm fortunate that I did have them, but just in time. (laughs) 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, you know, it does, but it didn't change anything. It doesn't change anything. And I think in, in, in writing, especially if you're self publishing, don't put too much pressure on yourself. It's okay to have a deadline. Sure. And you didn't panic the day that we had the event. You were no. supposed to be part of it. Yeah. And your books didn't get here. But you just kind of like, oh, well, they're not here. And you sat at my booth. Yeah, sure. I, you know? I made friends. I, yeah. could, I networked with people. I found other authors that I have a lot in common with. And I and think it was a great day. That's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. You make it a success. You make it an sure. event. Um, right. You know, don't just dwell on poor me. I didn't have this. Just make the best of it. So, yep. and I'm so glad last year mine weren't ready because that made people feel bad for me and want to help this year. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which I may not have had that sympathy if <laughs> you know if my books had been. There's ready. your silver lining, yeah. right? <laughs> so <laughs> it worked perfectly for me. I got help. So <laughs> go ahead, Jen. Well, this year I was going to have my second one out yeah. too, but with all the events from uh, my husband and and well, life being sometimes hurt gets in the way. Right? Yeah. yeah, sure. So it. Yeah, and that's what you have. I think that's the point we're trying to make. As an author, don't beat yourself up. Um, and right. In your case, you had a publisher and you didn't have your books here. So it's not even a case of being self, a self-publisher and not having things no. ready to go. Anything can go wrong. Oh, and, right, and, sure. And that is all in how you handle it that makes the difference. Yep. You know, and you can't dwell on it. It's not going to do good. I'm not going to say that I don't get upset about things. We all do. Sure. But what I do try to do within a day or two uh, is get over it. I had to talk to Jen about something today. <laughs> And tomorrow I'll wake up and it'll be a different <laughs> perspective on life. And like, <laughs> his dog wants to get false eyelashes. <laughs> Absolutely is going against it. I'm saying if it makes her feel beautiful, let her let go her with it. Let her do it. What the yeah. heck? That sounds like a good story. <laughs> <laughs> next thing you know, there'll that be a, a salon next, out there. That with could be your next children's book. <laughs> I don't there you go. Hey, oh, there you go. Your dog See? wants to be beautiful. Yeah. I'm making you rich. Perfect. and, and yeah. See, that's my job. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no. So anyway, there's a lot of lessons to be learned, especially if you're writing your own book like you did. Um, you know, we, we interviewed someone earlier who wrote his own book. And it's interesting how, in his case, his story took place 50 years ago. And I think in his case, what he was trying to do was protect, even though he really didn't say it, was protect his parents. You yeah. know, um, he didn't really want to go mm -hmm. out there and disclose too much until after it was fact. Whereas we have right. another author who went to the family, got permission to write her life story. Mm -hmm. I guess they, they didn't believe she was going to do it. Yeah, and then they dinged her for and it. And then after she did it, half the family don't talk to her anymore. Yeah. I mean, you know, so when it comes to writing, mm -hmm. consider all those things, I guess. Um, what's interesting about the guy we interviewed, his family actually never knew anything about what he wrote about. They oh, never wow. knew. His That's parents amazing. never knew what he wrote about. Yeah. Wow. Ever. Yeah. And he never told them. They never asked. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. And we'll leave that hanging. Um, because it, it is some story. Yeah, yeah. It's called the, uh, the, Harem, the Harem Boys Saga. There's yeah. five books. And it was by Young. His name is Bernard Young. But anyway, yeah, it's interesting that he never told his family what mm. his book was about. Right. Or his whole life. Or what his life was Can about. Can you imagine living your life for like four years or five years and your parents have no clue what you do for a living or what you've done or mm -hmm. right. who you know? Yeah. I mean, this man knew people from some of the richest areas of the world. Yeah. Right. And yet his parents didn't know any of this. Yeah. Wow. So. I think for me, the the passion to do what I'm doing far outweighed anything else you didn't mm -hmm. give any thought to any of that when you were writing the book yeah yeah um here it is and um but yeah. you did give thought to though before you published it as to what you were going to do with the assets from the book absolutely that part you did give thought to yes because um again it's a way to take what happened and and pay it forward and to take something that was a negative and turn it into a positive. Right. Absolutely, yeah. Right. Yeah. And you're like me. It wasn't necessarily the, the income that you were looking no, for. No, no. You know, it was never no. about that. It's ne it, it has never been about that. Yeah. It has been about my passion for Uganda and the people there 
and also, again, helping women and children here in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what's important. Why Uganda? Why because not? Jeffrey. Because of the connection that I made with Jeffrey. With him. And, okay. and especially after, like I said, I saw the world through his eyes. You know, he grew up in an orphanage, which, uh, you know, my father was also an orphan. So mm. I kind of understood, you know. And I saw the and, and just the things that the pictures and the things that I saw um, was just, you know, I just, it, it's still, when I went there, uh, there are still things that, as Americans, we don't have these type of issues yeah. that they yeah. do. And it still kind of shocks me some things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's what people need to, to understand you actually wrote this and didn't even know this person really other than on the Facebook or communicating back right, and forth with right. emails. And But you don't have to know someone to understand a situation. I mean, all you have to do is go and research yourself. Sure. Um, and w- you went this last year. You personally went there to see what it was about yeah. um, and saw for yourself you know, that it definitely is a worthwhile cause. I'm not saying that we shouldn't take care of people right here in America because you're doing that as well. Right. Um, but we, a lot of people say, why do we get involved with the rest of the world? Well, the rest of the world is us. Yeah, that's it exactly is part right. of who we are. And if we shut ourselves off from the world, then they're going to shun us at some point down the road. Right. That's right. And history right. has taught us what goes around comes around. Yep, that's right. So the world belongs to everyone, and we need to respect it and t- help take care of it. Um, and I, that's why I admire people who will go out there and say, save the whales or, you know, save the, yeah. the, the, you know, gorillas or whatever, because right. it, it's a part of all of this. It's not just, right. you know, that part of the world. It's it, the world. We're all connected. Yes. Yep. And one of the points that I've made was, you know, you know, people say that, too, like he's there and you're here. How do you know him? But listen, doll. There were people that were sitting right beside of me during the worst time of my life when I was going through the accident, when I was recovering, that did not give me an ounce of the same support that he did when he was 10,000 miles away. Yeah. Well, we're going to leave it on that note. Uh, We're running out of time. So I'd like to thank our guest, Martha Hoy, along with Janet Corsi. And again, Martha, where can we find your book? Amazon.com. Okay. And to learn more about our show, just go to aspectsofwriting.com. Uh, you can also visit the show on YouTube.com. Just go to YouTube.com forward slash Aspects of Writing. We are live on one, at 1 o'clock Pacific Standard Time on AMFM247.com. That's AMFM247.com every Saturday at 1 Pacific Standard Time. We're also on iHeartRadio, iTunes Radio, Google Play, Amazon. Where there's a dozen others. You can go to AMFM Network. Actually, you can see all the links. And then we're also on 14 terrestrial stations. Again, you can find those uh, outlets on aspectsofwriting.com. We archive our show on there as well, so you can go on there and and listen to past shows. And until next week, this is your host, James Kelly, reminding you, if you can dream, you can write it. And Martha, thank you so much. Yeah, thank thank you, you, Martha. All right, thank you. (laughs) 